Hi, everyone. My name is Melanie Kress, and I'm the Associate Curator for Highline Art, the public art program presented by the Highline in New York City. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for the future of monumentality. Before we begin, I have a few announcements regarding the logistics for the event. These will also be included in the chat. All attendee videos are automatically turned off and microphones are muted. If you would like to use the closed captioning, please go to the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on the CC option. Here you will be able to turn on the captions. Throughout the presentation and discussion, we will invite you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will select from your questions for our moderator. Please use the chat, as I see everyone is already, to engage with other attendees and keep the conversation going. If you have any technical questions, drop them in the chat and we'll make sure to answer them. And lastly, in the coming days after the series, a recording of this event will be posted in the Next City webinar archive for future viewing. The Future of Monumentality is presented by Next City, a nonprofit news organization whose mission is to provide reporting that inspires greater economic, environmental, and social justice. And the Highline, a nonprofit organization in Public Park on the west side of Manhattan, whose mission is to reimagine the role public spaces have in creating healthy, connected neighborhoods and cities. For me, this is a particularly special event as it marks a collaboration between Highline teams, Highline Art, and the Highline Network, a strategic learning community of infrastructure reuse projects across North America. The Future of Monumentality, as you all know, is a two-part speaker series that tackles questions surrounding monuments at a unique intersection of art, design, and urbanism. Over these two days, we will hear from artists, historians, architects, designers, and government leaders around issues of power, engagement, and representation. Thank you again for joining us for this event, and I'd like to share a special thanks to all of the Highline and Next City supporters here today. We would like to thank those who donated to attend the event. Your contributions make partnerships and events like this possible. And although we are in virtual space together, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I come to you today from Brooklyn, New York, on the ancestral land of the Lenape and Canarsi. If you are interested in finding the name of the indigenous people whose land you live on, please visit the link in the chat. I would now like to introduce our event moderator, Salamisha Tillett. Named by Gloria Steinem as one of the best contemporary feminist writers, Salamisha is a contributing critic at large for the New York Times and the Henry Rutgers Professor of Creative Writing in African American and African Studies at Rutgers University, Newark. She is also the founder of New Arts Justice, an initiative for feminist approaches to socially engaged art at Express Newark. In 2003, with her sister Scheherazade Tillett, she founded A Long Walk Home, an art organization that empowers young people to end violence against girls and women. We are absolutely thrilled for Salamisha to be joining us today as a moderator. Without further ado, Salamisha. Thank you so much, Melanie. I'm really honored to be here as well. Um, all of us have just gone through a transformative moment in American history and monuments have been central to that process. Um, the falling of monuments, the reimagining of monuments, and the potential for monuments to be a, a place of, or a site of um, unity, reconciliation, or reckoning. So I'm just honored to be in this conversation. Um, and I thought before I introduce our uh, prestigious uh, panelists, I would kind of pull from another um, art form, Natasha Trethewey's um, Elegy uh, for the Native Guard, uh, poem that she wrote in 2007 and just read two stanzas that I think are useful for us today. So she writes, the daughters of the Confederacy has placed a plaque here at the fort's entrance. Each Confederate, Confederate soldier's name raised hard in bronze, no names carved for the native guards, second regiment, union men, black flannocks. What is monument to their legacy? All the grave markers, all the crude headstones, water lost, now fish dart among their bones. And we listen for what the waves intone. Only the fort remains, near 40 feet high, round, unfinished, half open to the sky, the elements, wind, rain, God's deliberate eye. So I would like to introduce three of our um, panelists today who will be thinking through and discussing their work, but also um, part of a very lively conversation 
about what is monumentality to us today and what it has been in the past and perhaps how we can think about it for the future. Our first panelist is Justin Garrett Moore, who is a transdisciplinary designer and urbanist and is the program officer for the Humanities in Place program at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Our second presenter, Zena Howard, is a principal and managing director of the North Carolina practice of global architecture and design firm Perkins and Will, whose recent projects include the Smithsonian's Institution, a National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC, and the Motown Museum, Museum expansion in Detroit. And our final panelist will be Paul Ramirez Jonas, who is an artist who challenges the relationship between art viewer and art work, or artist viewer and art work, having presented solo exhibitions um, at the Contemporary Museum in Houston, the Museo Humanix in uh, Humix, sorry, in Mexico City, and the New Museum in New York, and many other places as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Justin, but I just wanna say that um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation again and look forward to um, our post uh, conversation with each other. my video here. It says video disabled by host. Justin, how is that now? All right, can folks can see, see me slide. and my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first I, I wanna thank, um, the High Wine and Next City for convening this important conversation about monuments. Uh, and so for my presentation, I wanted to give really an overview and, and background about uh, the topic of monuments and especially uh, how they are connected to our cities, our communities and, and our lives. Um, so the first sort of prompt that I would give is that monuments are grounded and rooted in uh, navigating the notion of power, uh, the, the conversation about, uh, you know, the dynamics of who has agency to even create and make a monument uh, to, to sort of mark space uh, and to uh, help shape some of our, our references and narratives uh, as people is, is quite important. And so this is a very old story. Uh, this is an image of uh, an obelisk in, in, in Luxor and the idea of uh, the, the sort of need for people to remember, to mark, uh, to, to, to show uh, their presence and their story is, is really as, as old uh, as, as people and community. But the reason I, I anchor this conversation in power is that uh, it, it is something that is used. It's sort of an instrument of uh, our societies, of our uh, infrastructures, uh, and our, our different forms of agency. Uh, so this is an image of the uh, re-erection of uh, the, the Lateran Obelisk at, at the Vatican uh, by uh, Domenico Fontana in 1586. So this sort of campaign uh, around uh, how we organize our space and our cities and, and the importance and power of symbols in that work uh, but one of the reasons I love this image is it sort of shows all that goes into that process, the labor, the materials, uh, the sort of the huge show of, of kind of power and resources uh, that somehow uh, get embedded uh, into these uh, sort of elements. And in this case, it was uh, sort of a communication of the conquest of the empire, the different versions of empire uh, that we all know and associate with Rome. But the, the connection between power and place is also important in that there, there is power in place. Uh, there's a, a quote from a, an unnamed um, Kwakawaka Nation um, a person that says, a place is a story happening many times. Uh, and this was something that was documented by 
the anthropologist Franz uh, Boas. Uh, but this idea of the story happening many times is connected to power. What are the narratives that we're shaping and reinforcing and retelling uh, in, in our current moment, but also with the idea that it, it, it goes into the future. And so the story of, of kind of the uh, what's happening many times, right? So I just show this image from 1500s uh, Rome. Well, New York City got in in the game too, right? So this is an image of moving New York City's oldest monument. Uh, this is the, uh, the Pharaoh Tutmos III's obelisk that had been relocated to New York City in Central Park in the 1880s. Uh, and again, you see this sort of extreme effort uh, being made. This is a sort of a railway that was constructed through Central Park uh, to move uh, this piece of, of global conquest uh, to be located in our city. Uh, and at the time, uh, uh, there was another one located in London, uh, and so New York was, was sort of positioning itself, well, we want one to this sort of uh, monument to uh, the city's capability and power and importance uh, as a global capital uh, along with London. And so this, this idea of, of kind of the, the, the role of power is, is something that I, I want to keep uh, sort of connecting us and anchoring us in the idea of, of power in place. This is uh, the statue of George III down in Bowling Green in New York City. Uh, after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, uh, people in, in New York went to Bowling Green to uh, remove the monument of the king, right? So the importance of, of this uh, marker and moment in place is there. So sort of fast forward to today, I, I think the, the idea of representation as we talk about monuments and, and kind of what they embody beyond the show of power or kind of the marking of memory is important. Uh, of course, this is the, the image that a lot of people will associate uh, with monuments, the figurative uh, sculpture, uh, very often a man or maybe even a man on a horse. Uh, but that has other subjectivities and other symbols connected with it. You know, who, who is positioned where uh, in the dynamics of, of the depiction of, of a history or a story. And so in New York, uh, the Public Design Commission, the Department of Cultural Affairs, and a number of, of different stakeholders went through a process uh, really following Charlottesville to look at the city's a public art collection and to think of, of it exactly as that a collection of, of sort of markers and, and elements. And so this was a, a research effort that was done to see who's reflected in our works of art. And so you'll see on the left side of the graph, this is sort of the beginning of the city's art collection that uh, shown in kind of uh, uh, taupe or the uh, white people that are depicted in our monuments kind of over time. Luckily, as the city's uh, uh, sort of trajectory moves forward, we do see increased diversity, uh, more women, more people of color uh, represented. And I think there's a, a, a great effort at the moment to ask that the future of our city's uh, public artwork and our, our markings in, in place uh, do reflect a greater diversity of people, including women and black, indigenous and people of color. But we also have to ask about who's making the work and, and who sort of is able to, to have agency in, in shaping the depictions and, and the marks uh, in our city and that this is another layer and form of power. Uh, and so this shows the demographic of artists over time in the city's collection. Again, uh, starting in the 1850s, it's, it sort of stays uh, kind of predominantly white and male. Uh, for a very, very long time that, that we're kind of accumulating this legacy. Uh, but, you know, really starting with the, the 1970s and especially the city's percent for art program taking off, we do see a diversification of that work uh, and leading to projects such as uh, the Harriet Tubman Monument in Harlem or the uh, soon to be uh, 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 developed uh, Shirley Chisholm Monument uh, that will be in Prospect Park. So these are Kind of ways of, of thinking about uh, you know both more traditional forms of, of depicting depicting uh, people in power and space but also uh, thinking about new ways and new modalities for art and artists to do this work 
And so I'll just end with sort of the prompt that these conversations about power in place need to be engaged now in a broad conversation and an inclusive conversation about how we reimagine and rebuild uh, our spaces and the, and the power that is embedded within them. Uh, and those may happen in different ways. Uh, this is the uh, Center Street Black Lives Matter mural. So this is an idea of kind of claiming uh, the space and the power uh, kind of at the heart of the Civic Center and, and our city's courts. In this case where uh, uh, artists uh, did an ephemeral work, kind of a temporary work to sort of mark and, and claim the space uh, uh, as a monument in, in and of itself. Uh, and with, of course, the statement that Black Lives Matter. And finally, I'll just end that uh, my new role at the uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, there's a five-year uh, campaign with a $250 million commitment uh, to really look at nationally and, and uh, what, what our kind of picture with our commemorative landscape is in, in America and what stories are we telling and how do we think about uh, people, power, uh, and place? Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Um, we'll hand it over to Zena now. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, great to be here uh, with you guys and, and appreciate um, this panel uh, that Highland and Next City has sponsored. It's so important uh, at this moment that we're in. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit um, from you know the built environment perspective in terms of architecture and how um, architecture and modern monuments uh, can be viewed. Uh, the current image that you see on the screen is uh, from one of our projects in Houston, Texas, Emancipation Park, uh, that was uh, you know in honor of, of freed slaves. And um, that, that image is a monument that, that uh, we created um, going there. But what I uh, would like to start off with is just thinking about um, you know, what, what is iconic and what makes monuments. Our, generally, um, our work centers around respecting the built environment really as an expression of our human understanding and collective values and this notion of ideals that um, are uh, unified across all is important to this notion of, of symbolism because uh, monuments uh, tend to symbolize ideas. Um, far from what individual buildings can do, uh, this results in, in the building themselves catalyzing the spaces around and between the buildings as platforms for democracy as you see in some of the images here from 2007 uh, 17 and 2018 uh, March for Our Lives rallies and um, the National uh, Women's March. This work, um, we were thinking about uh, monuments uh, several years ago and, and, and memory and uh, Justin talked about the power of place and, and that is so um, uh, able to survive as a result of memory. So this notion of, of remembrance. Um, so I. I sort of came up with this uh, notion of, of remembrance design. And this work reflects the recognition uh, that community partnering and investment is at the heart of, of these creations. And so beyond thinking about singular building typology, uh, the impact can, um, can extend out to cultural landscapes, urban placemaking, um, and beyond. So this sense of place, Justin just talked about the power of place, but uh, the sense of place, this notion of, of creating and preserving identity in space, sites, sites and cities, um, and understanding that, um, you know, this is what makes a project unique and, and every um, opportunity uh, to, to root a project in its firmly in its context. So this notion of re remembrance design um, that, that fuels place um, it's really a process for urban and architectural design that engages largely disenfranchised and negatively impacted communities, but it's really about the future, uh, a culturally sustainable and resilient future. Um, 
it's a way for oftentimes many communities to reconcile with the past and also uh, planning for a shared future. So just a few examples of projects over the past five years um, that uh, I and my firm have been associated with that really amplify many of the characteristics of what makes something monumental. This uh, National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, Georgia, it's really about inspiration to action and power, um, understanding how people mo mobilize from positive change. You see images here from the Arab Spring protest in 2010 to the civil rights marches in the United States, really exploring the physical gestures and connections to each other that people tend to make. Um, so looking at the, the diversity and, and how, um, how the building can reflect the diversity of people in tonality, in dimension, um, in, in color and saturation, connections to the city, um, merging with artwork. That came to really um, exemplify the, this notion of, of powerful placemaking. The second example is um, in Washington, DC, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Uh, obviously an iconic structure, but really um, what makes this a monument is it's symbolic of our common ideals and shared values. It really embodies a quality of permanence um, that resonates and inspires. That is achieved by um, the design being rooted in notions of celebration um, that all people can relate to, uh, modulating natural light, uh, Southern American agrarian sensibilities and concepts and West African art and architecture forms. Really seeing how you can pull from these, um, these uh, uh, symbols and, and sensibilities and, and abstract in a, a notion and um, sort of infuse that across the entire uh, design or conceptual design of the building. So from the inside, all the way to the outside, you feel uh, the notion of, of this as being really a, um, a, uh, an icon and that, that uh, encapsulates all of those notions that I spoke of. Um, next, you know, just, just really thinking about um, outdoor space, as I told you, we gave this a lot of thought in 2017 when really thinking about remembrance design and, and really thinking about how a small, um, one acre site can represent memory and its importance to future. Uh, this is in Greenville, North Carolina. You're looking at some historic photos of a thriving neighborhood anchored by um, their Sycamore Hill Baptist Church, which was really the heart of their community. It was destroyed by urban renewal and the community was um, displaced and dispersed as you can see in, in some of the images of the church being destroyed. And so really looking at how, how you can commemorate um, really despair and a sense of loss um, and, and the hope that was not realized um, with people. So uh, really thinking about what, what these folks uh, embodied in their time, pride, community, structure, spirituality, prominence and history, and looking at a way to sort of interpret that in a modern um, you know, memorial on that one acre site, the exact location of, of, their, of their church and bringing back these notions of prominence, of celebration, of spirituality, of worship and togetherness. Um, and this is uh, you know, the, the uh, recent uh, photograph of, of how that's done. Um, and it aspires to just bring back the hope and the feeling of, of what it was in its time um, without trying to replicate the, the church that was destroyed um, several decades ago. And finally, this last um, project, is, it's a massive project, but I'll just try to give you a sense in a, about three more minutes here. Um, Destination Crenshaw is in South Los Angeles. It's a project that represents um, defined as a monument because it represents celebration, community, place, and engagement. And really the project can be de defined as a community inspired public art and streetscape design project that really celebrates uh, this community. Um, it was, it's the impetus for this project was a metro line that's being um, built through this community right on grade um, 
dividing this community. Uh, and, and they saw opportunity to take what could be a hurt, yet another hurt to this community and turn it into something that can be leveraged for good um, with the one uh, bus stop there on the iconic uh, Crenshaw and Slauson Boulevard in, in South Los Angeles. And, you know, really looking at the vision, whatever we did, um, the project has to achieve these, these four anchors of, of heritage, um, wonderful assets that are there, unique experience and catalyzing growth. And so inspired by uh, the notion of, um, of um, as a conceptual driver, the African, uh, uh, giant star of the African diaspora, which is a rhizome that, um, that uh, was native to the savannah that came to this country and, and all other parts of the world through the diaspora, through the slave trade. Um, but this native plant actually survived and thrived here uh, in America. And so viewing this whole 1.3 mile boulevard really through four themes of improvisation, resourcefulness, first, uh, first moments and historical first dreams, the realm of what's possible and togetherness, people coming together to worship, to protest, to celebrate, um, looking at, uh, you know, really defining and using that metaphor of the giant star grass as the connective tissue um, that, that really links this whole 1.3 um, uh, mile boulevard and creates a place, a sense of place that, that's accessible to all. And this is really done by um, deep, deep partnership with the community to, to really look at ways in which historical figures can be represented in a way that's a, a quintessential Black LA aesthetic, um, looking at how graphic patterns can be from the community, can be imbued into branding and, and graphics, whether it's banners or, or the, um, the panels, the interpretive panels that tell the stories of, of Soul Train or Biddy Mason or um, Black Lives Matter, all which were birthed from, from this area. And more so, it's, it's a project about environmental equity. So bringing back, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the trees that were destroyed um, in 2012 when the, when the Space Shuttle Endeavor was brought through there, uh, all the trees were taken down. So bringing back um, native uh, trees. There is over 100 2D and 3D art and sculpture opportunities um, that will be punctuated along, along the boulevard. Some of them are massive, about 10 um, um, very massive uh, structure or, or sculptures along the lines of what Justin was presenting. And also, you know, just two last points, the, 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 the whole 1.3 Boulevard will start with a monument sign uh, that's, that's, that says Crenshaw, that speaks to uh, a particular graphic um, font that's unique to, to, uh, to Crenshaw. And, uh, and it's 120 foot tall. So it, it will be seen from an airplane, just sort of marking, marking this place. And then on the extreme other end of the 1.3 Boulevard is Sankofa uh, Park, a, a wonderful park um, that was uh, inspired by uh, the African Sankofa, which is a symbol, term and symbol that literally means to go back and get what was taken. Um, so we were inspired by a community member who spoke very specifically about what Sankofa meant to her and her family that grew up in LA. Um, and you can just, you know, sort of see images of, and, and the placeholders there for, for large um, art and architectural um, sculptures that are, that are going to go in the park. So um, thank you very much. And uh, let's see, I think uh, I am going to stop sharing and figure out how to do that. Yeah, okay. There we go. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Paul Ramirez Jonas, and I want to thank the Next City and the High Line, uh, and also the other two panels, Zine and Justin. Thank you. And um, so, I uh, the idea is we're going to discuss what is what is monumentality, and um, and I love this quote that Justin put up. Uh, I wrote it down. I'm going to use it from now on. A place is a story happening many times. 
And the thing, the thing about monumentality that I think a lot in my work is how do we balance a public form of address and an intimate form of address? Because it is those stories being told over and over and actually who gets to tell them and that that is not a singular voice. And if we're gonna honor individuals and at the same time address collective issues, then we need to create monuments that can also encompass intimacy of some form or another, because that is how you get to honor those individual voices that then tell the stories over and over and over again and make the place. So, so there is a chance to listen to what um, participants have to say. I'm gonna share a video and then I'm gonna show some images. So here we go with a typical Zoom thing where I will say, can you see this? Can you hear this? Uh, all right, and I'm going to press play. It's about five and a half minutes. Well, this is the promise table, and with here you can make a promise. Please take a seat. Are you making a promise together, or are you making a promise alone? Well, we ask people to make a promise, and then we put them along with other promises that we hear daily on the news. So things countries, politicians, weather people have all said that they're going to do. And then we put it up on the board for everyone to see. Sunsets at 7.01 today. India pledges to join climate deal. Chelsea Clinton vows to stay friends with Ivana Trump. And here's a space for your promise. So have you thought of your promise? Oh, okay, wait a minute, let me think about this. I don't think I make many promises. Sometimes so we promise things and our situation changes. I don't think people have made many promises to me, nor would I ask them to make promises I'm to me. I'm more concerned about if I don't achieve what I put out there, I'll be disappointed in myself. I'm very non-committal. But if, if I, I do, do, I take it pretty I seriously and follow, follow through, through with something. especially in the public realm. We have a promise! <laughs> it's funny because there's a lot of things I don't understand about public interaction, and there's some things I understand really well. And then there's something where I always feel naive, but it's always turned out true, is that I really trust people. If you trust people, if I'm doing a gesture of trusting you, really, not like a simulation of trust or a condescending trust, like really, I trust you, then I feel like people always meet you halfway. Uh, making a promise public has many steps, yes. right? A promise is a way for us to have like a little like contract together. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're going to put it down on paper now. It's both a contract and, and a drawing simultaneously. It also has our seal. And now all this needs to be complete is your signature. Now you have a choice. You can either give us your signature, sure. your fingerprint, or sure. your blood. Which would sure. you like? Put the blood anywhere you want. We have a promise. <clears throat> if you really believe in everyone's an artist, you got to make space for that. As much as a control freak as I can be about like the font size and the table and all of these objects, then what happens in the space that's literally being framed for the participant? I, I can't control that, right? And I'm trying to create a, a really strict framework for you to say something. So it's like I'm not delivering content as much as like trying to make space for the viewer's content. We have a promise. Yeah. Yeah. In order for your promise to become real, you have the option to make an oath or a vow. We have uh, the US Constitution, the Jupiter Stone. I swear to God. Okay, so when you shake my hand, you say the promise out loud. I promise to forgive my flaws. I suppose it's enjoy a your life seems like a better. I would promise to expand people's I horizon. promise to be a bridge that connects people to their destiny. I didn't realize that you like, you know, take an oath and put your name on it and, and they give you a copy of it. If I like frame it or something, I'll see it all the time. So now you're going to see your words so and I, I plan to like frame it and carry it see, with that's me. That's why I like it. Yes. Because it will hold me accountable. Exactly. That's I'm thinking I'm going to get this someplace I can see it often. <laughs>
I have a lot of hope for those drawings sitting in people's homes for years and years and years. And that is also a public I'm interested in. Like the friend that comes to dinner is like, what's that? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the story morphs and deforms and lives on. The other promises on the board, I don't know, they don't matter to me. Nobody means what they say and there's it's all empty promises to me now. It's sort of like the word love these days. Everyone uses the word love so casually. I think that we are challenged in our, our generation and at this time in life where people are saying all kind of things, especially if you consider, you know, this is the political time. <laughs> There's something I don't understand, which is that at the human level, we trust each other and we believe everyone is wonderful and everyone's a good person. But then as we scale it up, you can see there's a complete breakdown of trust. With this piece and hopefully with other pieces, I want to understand that. I actually don't have the answer, but it is the question I'm trying to figure out. Why is it that these contracts degrade as we scale them up? I'm going to um, switch to just some images. Um, and so I'll share my screen again. Share, there we go. And do this really quickly. All right. So um, yeah, what is monumentality, right? And, and what is the interplay between that and, and people and their ability? And I often think that an effective monument needs to have a scary amount of emptiness. And without that emptiness, then there is no space for participants. And also there is no space for change. Uh, so I often look at very traditional monuments. There's only about 13 to 15 forms that we've been using for a couple of thousands of years. Like public trust is based on uh, not just the idea of the oath, but also the wall with name. You know, the wall with text is a very basic monument. Um, but I also look at things like equestrian statues, obelisks. So this is called the commons and it's a classic equestrian statue, uh, except it's completely made out of cork and it's covered in pushpins. So this is at the beginning of, of the period where it is shown. And then what happens is people approach it. And again, back to Justin's quote, uh, it becomes a place where stories are happening many, many times. People know what to do with cork and pushpins, and they just start to cover the statue with notes. Um, I don't really invent anything. This is quoting a, already a pre-existing monument, but it's also quoting something that the public does under moments of crisis to monuments, right? They overtake them and they change their meaning by reinscribing them, even though it can be temporary with paint or banners. Um, except that this is kind of manufactured or engineered to create that opportunity. So that kind of public voice can be rehearsed. Um, and it really, the text that is written on it just simply reflects the quality of the public that participates in it. So not surprisingly, museums with free admission result in a richer, more varied text and varied reinterpretation than more enclosed spaces. Um, monuments, we are stuck with really just a handful, you know, like the obelisk is thousands of years old, the triumphal arch is thousands of years old, the pyramid, the wall of names, the fountain. You can think of them over in your head and all our monumental forms are quite unmovable. When I made the comments, I looked at this, right? Which is uh, the statue of Marcus Aurelius in Rome and it's the, only surviving bronze equestrian statue from antiquity. And then during the Renaissance, it became kind of this uber text that people would look at to try to reinvigorate uh, that tradition that had been lost during the Middle Ages. Um, I grew up in Honduras where my family's from and in the center of town, we of course have an equestrian statue of our hero, um, independence hero who also led Central America in its first civil war. So he was both our Washington and our Lincoln, right? He fought for independence and then he fought for the union. 
except that in Central America, the union lost and we became independent country. Um, after Francisco Morazan, this gentleman, our hero died, uh, there was a collection of money uh, and uh, two functionaries were sent to Paris to commission this statue. The story here diverges. Some people say they embezzled the money and they sent back a secondhand statue of General Ney, who was a French general who had fallen out of favor. And the rest of us believe that it really is a portrait of our hero. And why that is interesting is that this is not a fixed monument. This is a monument that you can get into a, a bar fight very easily. Uh, because it's still alive. Just the idea that it is so contested whether it is a portrait of the hero or not, to me, always serves as a model of what a good monument could be, that it, re it uh, resists that fixity of history, that it resists power by saying, this is the final inscription. The people of Honduras can debate this eternally. Um, Coincidentally, two years ago, I was in England and in a museum, I saw a painting of General Ney leading the retreat of Napoleon's troops from Russia. And I couldn't help but look carefully at his face. And I'll let you be the judge if uh, this is really a statue of our national hero or not. And I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this has really been quite interesting. And then just to, to end with the idea of trust. So I want to just do some keywords and then open and uh, start, you know, give you all your uh, questions. But some of the key words that came up in the conversation, power, equity, remembrance, permanence, ephemera, community, shared ideals, public and trust. And I think it's just really fascinating to kind of go from power to trust as a, an arc of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I want to start with this idea of power and almost, um, you know, we have a different definition or a different understanding. And as um, Justin um, pointed out, well, all the presentations point out also a different process of creating monuments today. than let's just say, you know, you gave us the whole kind of long history, Justin, but many of the monuments that we engage um, are from the 19th century. Um, Right, so that they, so they're commissioned, um, they're uh, done by a very specific, you know, patron class that can afford to do these monuments, and then they're infused with a particular set of histories and values. And now we're trying to have new conversations about what monuments can be and what they should function as. And so I was curious how you all thought about these ideas living side by side, um, because we're not necessarily. Um, getting rid of these other monuments that are infused with these older notions of power um, and patronage and um, certain civic identities that are trying to be preserved. But we're trying to imagine a way that new monuments can live alongside them um, or even disrupt them. And so I was curious how you all approach what feels to be like competing histories or oppositional spirits, but that we're trying to find a way for um, our different notions of monuments today to live alongside these other um, and arguably sometimes more oppressive and um, highly problematic notions of monuments as well. So anyone can answer, whoever wants to jump in. Sure, I'll, I'll start and jump in. I, I think you're picking up a really important point which is about process. Uh, and I think a, a baseline conversation is that these monuments are very often in the public realm, something that's common, right? They're, they're, they are about the space and the audience uh, uh, that, that Paul was re referring to. And so the process by which we, we sort of define our, our commons is a, a part of this conversation. Uh, and you know the, the balance between commissioning, right? Who can pay for something, who can maintain and keep something uh, is also something that we have to, to speak about. And so something that I would, would encourage people to, to sort of em, embrace is to think quite a lot about process. How do you create more inclusive processes? And what are the different components of making or changing or keeping a space that we need to understand 
and to develop really the tools to do it in, in more effective ways. Uh, and so that could be, how are you having conversations with people that live in a particular community, kind of the, the you know, those that are directly impacted by a place? Uh, how does that reconcile against other, maybe not uh, locally or geographically defined communities, right? That could be uh, the Black community, right? The uh, Italian American community, right? There are, are many different sort of shapes and, and forms for, for what that may look like. And so I, I think people are starting to uh, sort of comprehend this more and understand it more and to think ex explicitly and intentionally about power dynamics in doing that work. Um, so that's one kind of piece is, is thinking about what the tools for, for kind of more inclusive in engagement and processes look like. I think the other piece uh, does speak to kind of thinking about how do we do the work uh, in different ways. And so that is also something that is as diverse as, as uh, we are, right? Not, not everything is a, you know, a, a man on a horse, you know, elevated of, of us in something like a park and, and being really more imaginative uh, and, and kind of open to uh, other ways of, of making that, that out of necessity create a different kind of process, right? The idea of uh, creating a space for people to gather and, and exercise their culture is gonna be a very different type of process, but it may have the same result in terms of of creating uh, ways to, to uh, sort of embody cultures, to tell stories and, and to communicate that in an ongoing way, which I think is, is ultimately the, the sort of the purpose of, of uh, monuments and monumental spaces. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I would add, uh, that's a great question. So thank you for asking. I, I would just say, you know, this dichotomy between power um, and, and trust because uh, monuments are powerful, people recognize that. But um, in the past, in the monuments um, that are uh, traditionally, uh, the people that had the power um, demanded the trust. They, you know, they set the narrative. And so now as we look at modern um, monuments where uh, that is not the case. We still understand the, the, the power that monuments have to, to change the narrative, to create discourse, to allow people to come together. But I, I, I read a, um, a quote uh, or, or, or uh, recently that talked about that modern monuments um, really can only exist um, if there is a kind of unifying culture, a unifying narrative. So, so people put trust in that and, and that bursts something. So these two uh, uh, monuments standing in opposition to each other, um, how, how you go about reconciling or re I know people use the word recontextualizing these the, the prior monuments so that they coexist with um, our whole different approach today, which is what Justin's alluding to today. Um, we, we don't have a power structure that, that um, prescribes what we do. We, we have um, a culture more or less of, of people that um, of shared values that do that. So um, to some extent, it's, it's a good question that, that really doesn't have an answer, but some of the monuments that we're dealing with today are of such large, massive scale uh, that to sort of, um, you know, sort of counter, uh, you know, react to that, you almost have to do something of, of, of that scale um, to, to kind of balance it out. So um, it, it's still an open question, but a good one that'll, Keep going on. Yeah, and, and I want to build on what Zina said about this idea of counterbalance, right? Like I'm really interested in how we can have processes that create trust with a community, right? But we've all seen that be derailed when there's an amazing process um, where people are consulted, where people participate, but the final product is fairly traditional and mm -hmm. it can go really wrong versus I prefer to, how can I devise a monument or a sculpture that is about the process? So, so it, it never reaches this finality. It's like the, the product itself is, is a procedural performative thing. 
On the other hand, we have things like Mount Rushmore, right? That are massive. So like the record needs to be straight as well, right? And I don't know that the record can be, and this is something that I've drifted. I used to be completely against monumentality that was permanent and heroic. But if there is no uh, response to what already exists in the built environment, then what already exists is the only thing that's always mm -hmm. gonna be there. Mm -hmm. and, and artists like myself will create these ephemeral things that will go away. And uh, so I'm very torn. Part of me feels like fight power with power, hard to put it so binary, but it, and part of me feels like, no, you cannot use these tools to undo this thing. Right, like you really need a radical reevaluation of how we do it. So I'm kind of in the fence right now. Because yeah, let's just stay with that a little bit because here in Newark, so I'm at Rutgers in Newark, um, and we, um, the city, uh, took down the Columbus statue here in June. So I was able to witness that 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 kind of um, midnight taking down the Columbus statue. And now we're commissioning a Harriet Tubman statue. In its place, and I'm on the, the the committee that you know chooses the the statue, and we're renaming it Tubman Square, and it was a site of the Underground Railroad. And so it's an interesting question. One of the things that we've been thinking through is should this monument be figurative, right? How does it represent? Um, I think what you were talking about a singular um, monument to a, a to a single figure representing a collective. And so is it possible, I guess, in some ways, to have um, like forms? But have a disruptive history, right? So you're saying that you know you used to be, and I, and I understand. My impulse too is ephemera. Uh, you know, respond with something um, that's impermanent to disrupt the narrative of per permanence that's been so uh, totalizing. But I guess I want to throw that out there: this relationship between ephemera and permanence, um, things that are supposed to last, you know, forever, um, versus things that are supposed to. Um, reflect the community that exists in that moment. And so I don't know how you all approach this question. Um, and then Justin brought it up too with, I was thinking of the Black Lives Matter murals that popped up all over the country, including here in Newark, and then the taking down of monuments. That's, you know, the murals don't quite replace the monuments that are taken down, but it does respond to a question of time and power and place. So question, I guess, is ephemera and permanence. Um, and how do you all approach that question um, in terms of monuments, really? Should they be permanent? Should they be transitory? Things, you know, those are the, the two ideas, ephemera and permanence. <laughs> Um, I think I can start. Yeah, this this is this is the age old question. And, yep. um, you know, you started off with, you know, the Harriet Tubman example, can you, you know, do a, a monument that's figurative, and, you know, and guarantee that it's going to be, um, it's going to sustain and 50 years from now, people aren't looking to tear that down. I, I think, I think that's different, because what I think you can in my opinion, I think you can do that because I think that there are some individuals that represent those, that collective values, those things that make us human. And, and if we elevate that as opposed to um, uh, particular actions, because all humans have faults and failures and, you know, we're all not as successful. And so, you know, having a monument built to yourself, it, it, you know, I, you know, it's, it's a scary thing because, you know, you, as a human, you know, you're not perfect, but what does this monument represent? It has to be representative of something that we all share in and aspire to, um, you know, a collective group of people. So I think that's when those individual monuments can be, um, can be, um, successful in, in, in my opinion. And this notion of, of temporal or permanence, you know, architectural monuments, um, they become monuments because they're they're there so long, right? We, we, we look back and we define them as, as um, regardless of how they've been used, that, that they have kind of withstood, you know, kind of this test of time. And so um, it, time, uh, of something, the amount of time that something exists, regardless of what it is, sometimes by default, you people want to make it a monument, you know, regardless of what it was built for. So um, should they be permanent? I, I, I think some should be thought of that way, but I like what Paul said, uh, and I think I wrote it down somewhere when, when he talked about um, really just um, devising a monument that is, in, that is, um, 
that is the process, you know, something that is meant to, to represent, um, you know, the, the change in evolution, standing alongside of something like what you're doing, what you're doing in your city with Harriet Tubman. So, you know, I mean, uh, no, go just. Uh, I, I was just going to build on some of the, the points that Zina was making about the, the buildings also being kind of in the vocabulary, the, mm -hmm. the artworks and the kind of the sculptures are important, but I, I don't want to leave behind uh, the importance of all that we build, right, and, and the impact that that has special places. So, for example, uh, an African American church or uh, kind of important place may not get the same care and, and sort of reverence in society and may not become kind of a reference point and marker uh, in our cities as they're changing, for example. Uh, we all collectively witnessed, right, our, our, on January 6th, the, probably the most important monument in the country, right, the Capitol, <laughs> right, and, and just seeing that play out and, and kind of putting exactly this uh, uh, kind of tension in place, the, the building, the monument, or the idea, right? And I mean, just we all saw it uh, on, on live TV. And so I, I think we have to be more comfortable. I think um, sort of caring as much for the, 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 the living and kind of the process and the kind of the ongoing work that a monument does, the ongoing intention. Uh, and and I, I think the design or the kind of particular representation or embodiment of, of the, the thing itself can have a much broader vocabulary. Uh, and, and, you know, I always um, sort of give the example to people like if you were to, to think about your uh, favorite memory, for example, right? Something, a place that matters to you or, or a moment that matters to you, you know, that kind of idea is, is equally important. Uh, and I, I think the more that we can expand our vocabulary and our expression uh, for monuments, uh, I, I think the, the more we can be sort of in, inclusive and, and complete uh, in, in our way of, of doing that very important work with memory. I mean, my response to your question is that I think as Americans, we're so conditioned to think of scarcity when it comes to culture, right? Like, I don't think the military go like, um, we really need to choose between the nuclear submarines or the new attack jet because you know, Congress will be like, you can have both, right? And, uh, and I feel like when we are trying to decide what's better, permanence or ephemerality is because we are so used to having only enough for one thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I think also monuments are so contentious in communities because especially in New York where like neighborhoods change and are multi-ethnic and, and then you need to arrive at this magical, the one, right? Because, and frankly, it's often because we're only gonna get one. Imagine how the conversation would be if like, we're gonna put 12 in. Then I think people would be more generous about difference and possibilities and they might even accept abstraction. I don't know, but, uh, but I think we need to always remember that culture is not put at the top uh, as a pri pri fiscal priority and that that influences how we think even about what is possible. So. Yeah, and I, my last question, I'm gonna turn it over to the audience, um, is this idea of, you know, um, I really was struck by Zena talking about the in-between spaces um, between the buildings where communities can gather and protest um, in solidarity with each other. And so I guess one question I would have for Zena um, and then uh, to you as well, Paul, um, when you're creating these, in when you're creating the buildings, are you also imagining the in-between spaces, right? Are you imagining these alternative sites that can in some ways be different narratives or be different possibilities than even the building that you're constructing? And then Paul, I was thinking about how, you, I mean, obviously you're, you're really um, thoughtful about how to in, engage and in, 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 in dear trust, but also you um, create trust as part of the process in the sense that you said something that it's not the, the product or the object, but it's the, the, the opportunity that you give for the public 
to then participate in the process. And so you're, you're thinking about your process as creating space for the imagination of others. And so I was curious if you could you know, talk about these in-between spaces from an architectural point of view. And then Paul, from your process, you know, how do you imagine, you know, as you're going through your process of, of building um, out um, your, your monuments or your, your, um, your installations, you know, how are you thinking about creating that in-between space for these public everyday individuals to be artists themselves? Because it was really quite fascinating. And also, I'm, I'm biased to that, those kinds of projects because you can really see how you're creating the communities um, that we are trying to empower in the very the very installation process, but also the the, the um, performance of the work itself. And it's just quite, that's kind of what we want citizenry to look like, right? To be engaged, to, to entrust them, to empower them, things like that, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the in, in between spaces, you know, um, that that's something that um, we've me personally observed kind of more over time. I mean, as architects and designers, we always think of context. That's just mm -hmm. you know, what we do. But how broad that context goes out, and what I noticed um, in my work and in the work of the firm is that we would design a place, and then these these in between spaces um, took on a life of their own. They were sort of co-opted, they were sort of um, owned, and um, but the, the, the place or the building or whatever um, was, was, was the thing that catalyzed that, but we never could have, um, you know, sort of predicted how these spaces are going to be used. So that changed, you know, sort of our practice model, uh, where we began to really zoom out really big. I mean, um, and, and, and it also changed it to the point where even who we collaborate with uh, um, uh, had, had to change because of that, you know, collaborating with, um, with urban planners and, and uh, social anthropologists and policymakers and people just to understand the, con the social context of how um, we need to think about these spaces much more deliberately and not just really kind of focus on our building and our, you know, our, our, our piece of land that the building's gone over. So that's an evolution um, that, that's, for me personally, has really um, been over the past uh, seven or more years. Yeah, it, it's hard to. I'm, I'm trying to even understand the question. <laughs> well, I guess but, you said that you said that you're creating that your purpose was to create the space for the imagination of others. You said something like that, and mm, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's pretty profound, if you know, to to think about how generous it is, but also how much trust you have for the the audience itself, for your or your participants. Well, in, in some ways, I'm very influenced by Arjuna Padurai, who, who writes really beautifully about the imagination, because he, he does something where he describes what shaped the 20th century, or modernity, actually. And he decentralizes it from like Einstein, Freud, and he talks that basically what shaped it was the, the imagination of the poor, essentially, that it is the, the, the poor who have to imagine a better future, and then someone and it's also the, you know, the after effects of colonization where like the majority of people lived in countries that have been exploited and they're not sustainable. And then I have to imagine that maybe if I move to LA, I will have a better living. And I walk, you know, from Guatemala and I, that's all imaginary, right? It, 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 or, but so is white nationalism. There's a flip side, right? That these, these things don't exist. They're things we imagine and then we act on them. So the imagination is extremely powerful. It, it is, I agree with Arjuna Padurai, it is the most powerful thing shaping our world right now. And, uh, and where does it live, right? <laughs> Informally speaking as a sculptor. So often what I look at are speech acts, you know, like what happens when I promise something to you? What happens when I lie to you? What happens when I bet something? And because these are, uh, it's convenient, right? It's like, uh, that's voice and everyone has it. So then I can try to make a work where people can use their voice to kind of reenact these little social contracts. And uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but then if I can just make a form that can contain these everyday contracts that we have with each other that hold us together or even separate us, then 
that that's sort of the place where trust can be created or, or the reverse. I mean, I have a piece where people tell a lie um, and, and it's interesting that it's the flip of the promise uh, and it's also very, very effective in a way in, in terms of people get engaged really actively. Thank you. So I'm gonna um, uh, use the questions from the audience right now. Um, and here's one. So are there strategies or approaches to bringing some of these exciting ideas shared around monumentality, remembrance, recognition, power into public life and space with small budgets and community scale tactics that don't require enormous capital investment. So this is a question of power and resources. And another word I think that um, we haven't talked about, but I think Zina brought up equity as well. I, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that is a really good question because a lot of the work, you know, we, you see these small, these large projects, yes. Um, but, you know, there's a couple of examples um, right now, even here in the state that I'm in, North Carolina, um, you know, we're finally uh, getting at our capital in, in Raleigh, uh, uh, North Carolina Freedom Park. And it is just a really um, small budget. It started off as a grassroots effort because the heart of the capital of North Carolina, we're in sort of, you know, monuments to, to civil war <laughs> and Confederate uh, uh, territory down here. And for, um, you know, for, for Raleigh, North Carolina to, to get a, a small parcel of land, but it's very high profile to actually do a, a memorial to freedom that, that honors um, the enslaved people that, that were part of creating this. It's a, it's a small budget and it's start and it's still fundraising. I mean, it's still, still ongoing, but I think um, it has so much support just at the real emotional level from, for people. So these things can be done, but I will tell you, they, they, have, a, they have a long life <laughs> span because, you know, small project, I think we probably have been working on it for about six years now uh, to get that to fruition and still going on, but, but the investment ultimately is worth it. And I would say uh, these sort of smaller scale projects are actually quite important because they also have the potential for, I think a more grounded or rooted form of kind of communication and connectivity um, uh, a project that comes to mind is uh, Dr. Andrea Roberts' uh, Texas Freedom Colonies project. And this is uh, really the idea of, of going and collecting the histories and stories that have not been properly documented and archived and valued. And, and it may look like going over to a grandparent or great aunt's house and going through her programs right, to, to kind of mine and document the, the history so that that sort of uh, lost or, or maybe not fully kind of acknowledged story can have another life and another presence, right? And that's not something that is a, a $20 million capital project to do, you know, something with a, a city and state government dealing with politics, right? So those projects are equally important to think about what is the sort of um, you know, almost the rhizomes or the kind of the pieces uh, of, of stories and history and, and uh, kind of identity that, that we want to, to sort of connect. Uh, and so, you know, I think there are a lot of different versions of that uh, happening in different spaces, right? So there are people working explicitly on social justice or gender equality issues, uh, a lot of different subjectivities that are able to kind of do this work in, in the ways that are right for their community or and or their place. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that's quite important. And in many ways, the, the work that sort of needs to be done collectively is to be able to find what's the right way to kind of resource and support those efforts so that they can, can grow and, and sustain. Yeah, and, and I interpret that question as to like, can it be done small? And I think what's interesting about this panel is like, you can see each one of us represents a different range of, of budget, right? And and we're all doing it. Um, and 
and I certainly could show examples of, of doing it with almost nothing, right? Like a, with like $500 budget for, for an art to produce an artwork. So it's all that we, we need to kind of ask ourselves how many people are enough, right? If you, even if you address one or 10 people, is that enough to make that effort? Or do you need a hundred or do you need, it's like a mental exercise I ask people to do it. It's like, what's the number of people that you want to reach that then you think it's worth it? And, and once you start to try to quantify it that way, maybe you say, well, 10 people are enough. So then a uh, hundred dollar budget is plenty, right? Uh, and, and I always think of things, examples from the past, something like the AIDS ribbon, was quite humble in its production value, but it was the how it spread and how it distributed and how it concatenated and how it grew to become a giant statement. But um, the overhead of that was minimal, really, if you think about it. Uh, you could even make it yourself if you couldn't afford to buy one. Okay, thank you. Another question, and um, I'm just curious what you all think. Um, uh, uh, are what like what are your thoughts about de or the ability to decolonize monuments? So are all monuments inherently colonial? Um, and if so, how does one decolonize them? And if not, what are other ways of thinking about um, our relationship to these monuments from the past? I'm assuming you're going to say they're not all inherently colonial <laughs> because they monuments exist in different countries and different spaces at different times, but just curious. So decolonizing and then um, maybe alternative ways of thinking about that, that diet of um, uh, colonial and decolonizing um, monuments. Well, I'll start. Uh, um, you know, it's uh, I, to your latter question, which is the easier one to answer. I know I don't think all monuments are are colonial, um, but you know, but we have to to think about what has happened. Is that so in some instances, it's not necessarily that what the the monument um, represents is is um, is colonial. It's that it 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 was pulled out in a silo and um, revered and venerated in isolation and the context of, of what, um, what made that happen was, is much more important sometimes than the actual, than the actual monument and that context was left out. So, um, you know, what is, what is our role in, decom in, in uh, decolonizing monuments? Um, some of them uh, I, I do believe are just, are just um, so far um, wrong. I mean, you know, that, that you really have to take a hard scene. You're going to have those, some of them that, that represented people that don't um, uh, subscribe to the values that we do as a country back then um, based on their acts and based on the time at which the monument was constructed, the purpose for which it was constructed, um, which was largely, you know, to intimidate or for a particular purpose, that has to be dealt with more severely. But I do think, um, I do think others just need to be thought about in a way that we can, we can really tell the full story. And I think that would address um, largely the concerns of our more, you know, diverse uh, America today. Yeah, the, um, I agree with, with, all of those points and and the reason I showed the kind of the obelisk uh, was to to speak to how old of a problem this is, right? Um, <laughs> like and you know I, whether or not our generation or our era of humanity is going to be the one to figure it out, I don't know. But um, it, it is a, a really old kind of challenge, and so a, a way that I. I like to engage these sort of the decolonial or even the anti-racist conversations is to ask what are the different types of work that it took to get us here, right? And so the image I was showing of the obelisk, right? There's, hey, there's a monument, this is for a powerful person, but then we have to talk about labor. How did the thing get there, right? What, what, was, what were all the systems that, that created that and to actually spend as much time and energy talking about that as you're talking about the the symbol of the thing, because ultimately that's what it is, right? It's a symbol of of the systems and and the kind of the elements that that created it, 
right? And so if we're talking about the, the way that we engage these questions today, and especially so many of the conversations about social justice or equity or uh, how we're, we're reckoning with, with issues like racism or, or uh, uh, gender discrimination, I think a lot of our energy and attention needs to talk about what are the types of work, what are the systems that, that we're using to kind of even produce uh, the, the thing itself, uh, fair wage, um, authorship, who is in the archive. I mean, there are just so many different components and elements of it. What's in the, once you put the thing up, what's in the school curriculum? That the average person that's gonna walk by the thing is gonna be able to engage in it. And there's the idea of complexity, for example, right? Are we doing that work? for human beings to understand complexity, to be able to communicate with each other, right? So I, I think we have to, to expand that conversation. Yeah, I, do, I don't think that monuments per se are colonial, but, but, um, but I do agree with Zena that some things are, are beyond the pale, right? And some things are, even when you put them in context, you're, for example, how uh, maybe it would be different if those Confederate monuments had been put up by the Confederacy and they were actually part of the historical record, but they're, they're not. They're actually, uh, they themselves are revisionist history. So um, that, that is the inherent problem with them. Um, but we do need to acknowledge that as human beings, we are made of oppressors and oppressed and, and the hist our material history reflects that, right? Like that, obelisk that Justin showed is like, it's, how did it get to New York? But how was it built in Egyptian times? Holy mackerel, mm -hmm. right? It's like, I don't even want to think really what went into it, but does that mean that we don't acknowledge it? I think one of the most puzzling and beautiful moments was in a Highline event uh, in Toronto for this thing that I participated in. And a, a Canadian, a Native American from Canada, I wish I remember his name, came to give a land acknowledgement. And it was tremendous because he acknowledged that the land where the city was belonged to his tribe. And then he acknowledged that his tribe took it from another tribe oh. way before settlers yes. came. And then he acknowledged that there was an archeological dig nearby where they found bones of a people that was neither of those tribes. And, and all he did was acknowledge that, that, you know, that, that uh, contemporary Canadians took it from, from his tribe, that his tribe took it from another tribe and that they probably took it from yet another group of people that we know nothing about. And I think that that acknowledgement of the conflict, instead of trying to kind of brush it under the rug or, or pretend it never happened or lie about it, um, I don't know. There's something in in that that I think we need to learn uh, to to handle better. Thank you. And it just also reminds me of um, you know, Foucault's archaeology of knowledge and thinking about history as sediments versus um, one monument. Actually, right, that there are all these all ways in which these, or even palimpsest, um, palimpsestic. There are all these layers that create who we are, but also how we should um, imagine and remember the past and also you know, move forward in the future. So I just wanna say thank you so much. This has been such a, a wonderful conversation and I am sad to bring it to a close. I'm gonna invite Kelly on. Um, she's going to uh, wrap us, you know, wrap it up and, and send us on our merry way. Um, but thank you all, Paul, Justin and Zena for such a delightful and thoughtful conversation. Um, and thank you, um, uh, Kelly. Great, thank you, Sal and Misha. And I just wanted to say thanks to um, to Justin and to Zena and to Paul for a really uh, beautiful conversation and to Sal and Misha for weaving all of these threads together into um, a really um, urgent conversation. And to Justin's point, you know, this is not a new subject that's millennia old, but <laughs> but you know, it's a it's something that we have to grapple with. So. Um, I just had a few comments before um, before we go. Just some notes to um, 
tell folks. And uh, the first is please join us tomorrow for the second event in this series, which is about alternatives to monumentality. So it'll be the same time tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. Salamisha will also be moderating that conversation as well. So if you haven't already registered, um, we, my colleagues will drop the link into the chat for you to go to. So, um, and after both of these recordings, um, after both of these events, we're gonna make the recordings available in our webinar archive. So in case you wanna rewatch, or if you wanna share on social, or if you want to um, pass along to someone who wasn't able to join us. So um, you just go to nextcity.org slash webinars and um, that's our archive. We'll also put that in the chat. Um, before we go, I wanted to thank the Kresge Foundation um, for supporting Next City's reporting on equitable creative placemaking because it does intersect with so many of the issues that we heard about today. Um, so if you want to stay connected um, to our coverage on those topics and where we are in this space, I encourage you to subscribe to our arts and culture newsletter. Um, we'll also yet again put that link in the chat. Um, and uh, I also wanted to raise up the, the idea that in conjunction with this event, we're also doing some reporting on the future of monumentality. Our first story about it actually ran today about re-envisioning monuments in St. Louis. So I encourage you to check that out. And we'll be compiling those stories, plus some edited transcripts of this, um, this, these two events into an ebook that will come out um, you know, a little bit down the road. So um, keep an eye out for that at nextcity.org slash ebooks and, um, and you can read our kind of collective um, accumulative knowledge about the, these, um, about the future of monumentality. So thank you to everyone who attended today um, and for your really thoughtful questions and your deep engagement. I mean, everybody was clearly very, uh, excited about the conversation, as was I. So, and thank you especially to um, our partners and friends at the Highline and the Highline Network um, for partnering with us to make this event possible. So we're gonna keep the chat live for a few minutes. If you guys wanna go back and scroll through and, and um, find any links or save anything. Um, and yeah, for now, I just wanna say thank you again for coming and for those of you who donated to the event to make it possible. and. Um, hopefully we'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Bye for now.
you